people of Racine, Wisconsin were shocked when the body of Derby Wagner Richardson was recovered near her workplace. Who would take her life so mercilessly and why? The townspeople knew the truth, but the man responsible for this heinous crime was free. The man had been accused several times of battery and abuse, yet he was not convicted. How many more lives would be taken before the police would take action? Ruth Elaine Wagner was born in Waterstown Township, Blue River, Wisconsin, but her parents settled in Boscobel. She grew up on a farm in the turkey capital of Wisconsin and married her high school sweetheart, Robert Lindner. The couple had two children, Deborah and Byron. Deborah was born on May 2, 1958, in Boscobel. Her grandparents, Bertha and Harry Wagner, adored her completely. Affectionately, they called her Derby, and the name just stuck. Born just a year after her teenage parents got married, Derby endured a lot right from the beginning. Her father, Robert Linder, was in the army, so that meant the family moved around a lot. He was young, and this was one way to make ends meet and provide for his growing family. Derby never completely felt rooted in one place and was unable to make friends until she was almost nine years old. Her mother did settle down in Madison in May of 1967, when she went through a messy divorce with Robert Linder. Ruth Wagner stayed single for a long time, focused on caring for her children, but she found love again in 1974 and married James Erickson. Derby was upset with her parents' divorce. She decided to run away from home when she was 14 years old. Back home, her mother's marriage ended, and she would remarry in 1986 again. Derby had no way of knowing this since she was already busy with her own life. Douglas Coppin stepped into her mother's life, and Derby had stepbrothers Daniel and Alan Coppin. She had a baby sister, Gina Coppin, as well. Her family had grown, but she felt lonely and left out. She needed to build another life as she felt abandoned by her mother. Two years after running away from home, Derby walked into a bar in Racine. Like a bad joke, and like any impressionable teenager, she fell in love. She met Fred Wagner Richardson at his bar. The 30-year-old was quite experienced. He had joined the U.S. Army under a false name, and that impressed young Derby. What she did not know was this man was bad news. He had a long record of misconduct and felonies in the Army. During his time in the military, he allegedly leaped out of the bushes, assaulting and robbing a man. This led to a prison term and a dishonorable discharge. Following his move to Racine, he acquired two additional robbery convictions. He only served a portion of a 15-year sentence. Why he was allowed to roam the street so freely was only because of the criminal justice system. Criminals can walk free based on small legalities. Upon being released from Leavenworth Prison, he decided to live in Racine. Racine has been a typical industrial town and provided the opportunity Fred was looking for. He opened up a bar where he met Derby, who was then 16 years old. Fred Wagner was smart. He might have been a career criminal, but by swindling and wit, he could own a few rental properties around the town. They consisted of low-income housing units. He had a reputation for being ruthless in his business dealings and in his personal relationships. He was all about facts and very cold when it came to money. Fred gave her work as a bar dancer. Still a minor, she faked her way for years, dancing for tips. She did not know how to protect herself, and this was the first job that paid her enough to live slightly more comfortably than on the streets. Being a minor, she could not legally be paid, so Fred took advantage of this fact and exploited her. Since he had rental properties, he gave her some shelter as well in exchange for her services. 
He managed to have control over her from the very beginning. She saw him as her savior, while he was just using her. Derby and Fred got married in 1979. They went on to have two babies, August Marie and Joy, born in 1980 and 1984. By now, Derby had introduced her family to her mother Ruth. Ruth did not approve of Fred from the get-go. Over time, Fred became more and more dominating in the marriage. Several of Derby's acquaintances and colleagues knew about the strain in the couple's relationship. After the initial honeymoon period, Derby quickly realized she was trapped in an abusive marriage. Fred was much too aggressive when he was angry and was exceedingly controlling. Since she was a teenager when she married him, she endured the abuse until she could build up her own strength. Her friend and colleague, Kelly Williams Cherry, would often babysit the couple's young girls. Kelly was among the people whom Derby confided in about the mistreatment she endured from Fred. In June 1986, Derby gathered the courage to walk out on Fred. She ran away after enduring a rocky marriage for several years. Derby was also quick about legal proceedings after being advised by friends and lawyers. Despite Fred's aggressive response, she stayed her ground and did not budge. She initiated divorce proceedings in December 1986. The couple shared significant real estate assets in Racine, which needed to be divided. Fred faced the prospect of losing a considerable portion of his earnings. This included an alleged 50% of the properties and 25% of rental income, amounting to an estimated $250,000. Derby could not bear the violence any longer and was terrified that Fred was on the brink of harming her. He was not one to stay quiet in money matters. Things got ugly very fast. Since it was all still very fresh, Derby was not sure how the custody arrangement was going to be. So she agreed to let Fred take the girls every other weekend. But Fred was vindictive. He had something else in mind. On January 21, 1987, Derby was preparing to send the girls off to their father. Fred showed up and beat Derby in front of the little girls, three and seven years old. They were scared out of their little minds. He strangled Derby till she fainted. Five days later, she filed a temporary restraining order against him. He was also convicted of battery a few weeks later. Things were escalating fast. She knew she had to get away and save her life. Derby was working very hard to turn her life around. She was working very hard to provide a good life for her girls. She was only 28 years old, so she had a lot she could plan for her future. Derby held down a lot of jobs. She served as a secretary at the Visiting Nurse Association of Kenosha and worked as a security guard for Guardian Protective Services. She also acted as a fitness counselor at the Racine YWCA over the weekends. She had recently applied for the role of Deputy Sheriff of Racine County. She wanted to work for Racine County Sheriff's Office and aspired to become part of law enforcement one day. She wanted to help teenagers that were caught in helpless situations, perhaps also help women out of abusive marriages. On March 21, 1987, a meeting occurred between Derby, Fred, and their respective attorneys. It ended in a manner that made Derby feel like her life was in danger. Her attorney concurred and notified the police to request police protection for Derby. Barb Smith, who served as a victim witness specialist at the Racine County District Attorney's Office, guided victims through the legal proceedings. She vividly remembered helping Derby when she sought a temporary restraining order. Smith explained that it was a time before domestic violence cases required mandatory arrest policies. This meant that the police had the discretion to decide whether to arrest the alleged abuser. In 1987, 
Victims had to physically visit a police station to file criminal complaints. When Derby reported her battery, obtaining a temporary restraining order was a separate process. Smith expressed frustration with temporary restraining orders. She described them as largely ineffective and often igniting the situation. She recalled advising victims, this is the most dangerous time for you. She emphasized that the restraining order could escalate existing violence. As Derby left, Smith could vividly remember her saying, it does not really matter. He is going to destroy me anyway. In that particular meeting on March 21st, the pair were dividing multiple rental properties that they owned together, including rental income. Reportedly, Fred cried and said, I am very hurt. I am very hurt. Fred Wagner Richardson pointed a threatening finger at her and said, I do not like being hurt. He was incredibly upset that he would lose money from his rental properties as a result of the divorce. Derby worked as a night shift security guard at Steiberg Engineering, 1600 Gold Street. She patrolled the inside of the locked building, surrounded by a fence topped with barbed wire. As usual, on the evening of March 21, 1987, she left her girls with Kelly, her friend who babysits her children. Derby would always make her promise that if Fred ever showed up, she would not let him near her girls. Kelly was the only one she trusted with her girls as she went off to do multiple jobs to make ends meet. This was about 12 hours after her hair-raising meeting with her soon-to-be ex-husband. Despite being emotionally shaken, Derby had to go on. Derby usually checked in with her firm at 1 a.m. She failed to do so that night. The firm grew concerned when they realized she was not responding and was nowhere to be seen. The management of Steiberg Engineering called authorities around 1.30 a.m. when they could not locate her. Investigator Al Fellian responded to the scene that morning in his capacity as a patrolman. Officers proceeded to Steiberg and initiated a search for her and her Pontiac Sunbird, but they were unsuccessful in locating her. Seven hours later, around 8 a.m., an officer spotted Derby's car. It was parked in an alley at 1546 Layard Avenue, just north of Steiberg Engineering. This was all fine, except for one unsettling detail. Blood was dripping from the drainage holes in the trunk of her car. The blood ran down the pavement. Inside the trunk, police recovered Derby's lifeless body. She was completely naked and her mouth had been gagged with white duct tape. Her throat and wrists had been slashed brutally. She was nearly decapitated. Such was the aggression of her neck wounds. Over the next 24 hours, her clothes were recovered scattered along the street. Her tan uniform, her security badge, and a shoulder patch from her uniform, along with a brown shoe, were found. A man living on Island Avenue found some of her papers and her ID. In the early hours of the next day, a newspaper carrier found her appointment book on Spring Street and Highway H. Investigators also recovered a pair of black and red bolt cutters from the scene of the crime. DNA analysis was still not well known, but everything was well preserved, as was the procedure at the time. The medical examiner revealed some disturbing details, but they would help paint a picture of what exactly happened. Derby still had all her jewelry on her body so she was not being mugged or robbed when this tragedy happened. That was ruled out as a motive. There was also no evidence of assault. A pathologist carried out a thorough examination. He confirmed that the injury to Derby's head was caused by bolt cutters. Investigators discovered that the suspect had entered the Steiberg engineering property by cutting a section of the chain-link fence along its east side. Crime scene photographs revealed a shoe print on the property with a pointed toe resembling a cowboy boot. 
This matched the footwear worn by someone she knew, as investigators later learned. Derby had a routine of bringing her children's clothes to work for folding. She often parked her car by the lunchroom door to easily carry the laundry basket back and forth. So the perpetrator was waiting for her and attacked her while Derby made one of her trips. Her jacket was found with inside-out sleeves. An examination revealed that someone had attempted to grab Derby from behind. She managed to squirm away and flee towards the nearby office, as marks on the door indicated that Derby locked herself inside. They could see denim marks on the door. It looked as if someone repeatedly pushed against the door with their shoulder, wearing a denim jacket. The assailant struck her unconscious, then proceeded to tape her mouth with white duct tape. Then she was transported to the trunk of her car. The presence of duct tape suggested premeditation. According to experts, Derby's personal items were scattered around town to mislead investigators. It seemed plausible that the perpetrator feared becoming the prime suspect. Investigators deduced that the assailant drove Derby to another location where she was stripped and subsequently lost her life. He then drove the car back to her workplace, perhaps because the perpetrator needed to retrieve their own vehicle. This was vengeance, a hateful crime against Derby. So three things were certain. Number one, the perpetrator was probably someone with a personal vendetta against Derby. Number two, it was someone she knew because they were familiar with her workplace routine. And number three, Derby had struggled and fought till the end. A relative realized that the black and red bolt cutters in evidence belonged to none other than Fred Wagner Richardson. A tip directed the police's attention to a vehicle resembling Derby's. It was spotted near Fred's housing property on State Street that fateful night. Witnesses recalled seeing someone loading an object into the trunk. A large object like maybe a rolled-up carpet. Acting swiftly, law enforcement executed a search warrant at the location but they struggled to gather enough evidence to charge her ex with the slaying. Throughout, Fred steadfastly maintained his innocence. During the investigation into the case, authorities recovered evidence from both Steiberg Engineering and the vicinity where Derby's car was located. An RPD officer on night duty reported sighting a vehicle similar to Derby's parked at the rear service door of 1212 State Street around 3 a.m. The property was under the ownership of Fred Richardson. Residents of the property informed the police that the basement and rear door where the car was parked were solely used by the property owner. None of the renters had keys or access to that part of the property. They recovered a sales receipt for red bolt cutters, the same type found on the crime scene. Fred had made some unusual comments to his friends. A lot of them seemed made up and would turn out to be untrue as officers interviewed various witnesses and friends. He allegedly told a friend that he was too busy to make plans over the weekend because his children were going to spend the weekend with him. It was Derby's turn to have the children that weekend, so it did not make sense for him to lie about it. What was he trying to hide? When another friend wanted to meet up, he said he was sick in bed all weekend. Brian Linder, Derby's brother, insisted Fred was the only one who would want to harm his sister. Ruth Wagner, her mother, and all of her loved ones repeatedly asked the police to investigate Fred. The tragedy took a toll on Derby's mother. Ruth had been looking forward to Derby's independence. She had finally walked out of an abusive marriage and was going to progress in life. Now, her granddaughters were left without a loving mother. And most frustratingly, the man she knew was behind her demise was walking free. Initially, Ruth took in the two little girls, but then Fred fought for them. After a two-year-long bitter custody battle, he won custody of his daughters. 
Not one to sit around helplessly, Ruth became an advocate for victims' rights legislation in Wisconsin. She got busy working as an accountant, realtor, and even a prison guard. From an office manager to a tax collector for the state, she had a diverse experience. She did everything, so she did not have to face the pain of losing her daughter. She regularly urged the police to work on her daughter's case and solve it somehow. Days turned to weeks, weeks to months, and finally the months gave way to years. A decade after the tragic discovery in the industrial alley, the case remained unsolved. Her mother held a 10-year anniversary in hopes of motivating the police. Each time there was publicity about her daughter's case, the police department got calls and some faint leads. To boost the visibility of the investigation, Ruth organized a public vigil. It took place in the alley where her daughter's body was discovered. The event was scheduled for 6 p.m. on a Saturday in the 1500 block of Layard Avenue. She chose a weekend so that a maximum number of people would show up. During the vigil, some attendees would recite writings about Derby. Others would be encouraged to share their memories of her. Ruth also mentioned that a balloon release would be included as part of the vigil. Time had helped Ruth come to terms with the tragic reality of her daughter's final moments but she still felt a pang of pain whenever the well-intentioned but perhaps ill-considered saying, life goes on, was mentioned. Ruth remarked the following, Yes, life goes on, but not as we intended. I think about her every day. I still miss her every day. She struggled with a profound and enduring sadness stemming from her inability to share her life with a daughter. Derby was headstrong, independent, and dedicated to providing a better life for her two daughters. Ruth hoped that the publicity of the vigil could spark a memory. Maybe someone would see Derby's picture on the TV and remember who she was. Or perhaps they had seen Fred. Maybe, just maybe, someone would come out with information. For the Racine Police Department, it was an embarrassingly open secret. They knew Fred was a possible suspect, but their hands were tied. By then, Fred had moved out of Racine. He settled in southwest Philippines, Consolacion, Cebu. He married a woman named Lola. His girls grew up there, and he spent a content life. He would go on to have more children and even grandchildren, one of which he would have shared with Derby. August Marie's daughter never knew her loving grandmother and was further estranged from her great-grandmother Ruth. Through his attorney, Domingo Cruz, Fred consistently denied any involvement in the case. Cruz also dismissed the police's focus on his client, suggesting it stemmed from a desperate desire to make an arrest. Cruz continued to represent Fred in the investigation. He criticized the police for quickly zeroing in on his client as the suspect. He feels that they have neglected other leads that could have led to the true perpetrator. Her teenage daughters were growing up without Derby and Ruth, and knew only Lola and Fred. They believed their father had been wrongly interrogated. Ruth retired at the age of 69 and continued to volunteer and attend support groups, she passed away in 2022 with Derby's case unresolved. But she had expressed her wishes that those who attended her funeral service would wear bright colors or their favorite colors. She did not want flowers. Instead, she urged everyone to make donations to domestic abuse intervention services in Madison, as well as the Women's Resource Center and Bethany Apartments in Racine. In a way, losing Derby shaped her life to be that of a voice for the helpless. But even after she was gone, the sinister words of Fred would be stamped on her memorial profile. He coldly commented, Karma has a way of leveling the playing field. In 2024, officers paired with a documentary team that wanted to further investigate the case. They visited Fred, 
who was now back in the States. At 82, Fred was confined to a wheelchair. Although Fred's new wife led officers in, Fred did not want to talk. Al Felian, the original detective on the case, reopened the files and went through everything with a fresh perspective. Nothing was new. Despite this, the team believed they had gathered sufficient evidence to present the case to the district attorney. Brian Linder, Derby's brother, shared that their mother would have been very relieved. Earlier in 2024, Racine PD was given a tip that Fred, who is a convicted felon, was illegally in possession of firearms. They had a search warrant for his rental properties. Police searched Fred's home on March 28, 2024. They recovered four handguns and two tasers. They also recovered a pair of bolt cutters that were identical to the ones found at the crime scene in 1987. It was identical to a pair he bought a month after Derby's demise. It was illegal for him to own firearms. As a result of this investigation, an arrest warrant was issued. Fred was arrested at one of his properties that same day. He was charged with first-degree engagement in premeditated unlawful slaying, four counts of possession of a firearm by a felon, and two counts of possession of electronic weapons. At 82 years old, Fred could face the remainder of his life in prison. 37 years later, Derby was finally going to get justice. The Racine PD held a press conference on April 5th to share the news. On Wednesday, April 10th, 2024, Fred pleaded not guilty to the case in Racine County Circuit Court. He is presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt by the law. Prosecutors asked for a million-dollar bail for Fred. The court commissioner approved $50,000 cash and a $50,000 signature bond. Fred provided the $50,000 cash and was subsequently released. Racine County District Attorney Patricia Hansen emphasized the importance of linking Fred and his belongings to the crime and its timing. Investigators noted that there were no significant new developments in the case, but highlighted a recent shift in perspective by two detectives. District Attorney Patricia Hansen stated that there was enough circumstantial evidence to proceed with the trial. She emphasized the need to present the evidence in court. Derby's family expressed their desire for justice. They acknowledged the toll the situation had taken on them. When news channels knocked on Fred's door for comment, he did not respond. District Attorney Hansen feared he might flee given his ties to the Philippines. As a result, he had to surrender his passport. Derby's brother expressed his disappointment in the system, but also an amount of relief. Ellie Schmidt, aunt of Derby, said, I do know I speak for the entire family in expressing deep gratitude to everyone who made it possible for us to be standing here today. She also said, Ideally, it would be my sister Ruth standing here. She fought so hard and for so long to get justice for her daughter's case. Racine County Detective Todd Lauer said that, We have asked ourselves that question many times. Why? Why not? Years ago, the case was always there, right? We were able to lay it out in a way where we thought there was a common sense case and it was ready to be put in front of a jury and let them decide. Racine is a small town. They did not have enough resources to do more thorough investigations and follow-ups. And secondly, they knew a grand jury wanted more evidence than they had before. But all the evidence they had pointed to Fred. He had the means, the motive, and the chance to end her life. 37 years is a long time to wait for justice. Fred got to remarry, have a son with Lola, and see his grandchildren. Derby did not get a chance to do any of those things, as her life was cut short for vengeance. A status conference is scheduled for July 12, 
2024.